Hidden Gems, it's time for another live hidden hour. Thanks for waiting an extra day. We typically go live on Saturday nights. Today we're going live on Sunday night, which we have a holiday tomorrow. It's President's Day. So I hope that many of you hopefully have a day off tomorrow and you get that extra, extra day to the weekend or you're doing something fun. Uh, it was so fun though. Just I, I just have to tell a quick story that uh, last night, just after I announced on our Facebook and Instagram and all of our social media that uh, we were going to have to reschedule for tonight because my plane was delayed, around the start of Hidden Hour, I was hanging out at the airport waiting for my flight and realized that I needed a gift for our son. And I walked into uh, the, the Utah store in the Salt Lake City airport and quickly kind of abruptly asked, do you have this shirt in this side? You know, um, a, a Utah dinosaur shirt. And she said, you're Lauren. And it was a hidden gem. And she said that she had just read, she had just read the social media announcement that we weren't going live last night and she was disappointed. And then, and I walked and it was so fun. It was so fun to meet Shirley last night. So Shirley, if you're watching, thank you so much. Our son is wearing the shirt right now. So we so appreciate that you were there last night. And we're back together as a family. For those of you new to our show, Dr. John is a forensic and clinical psychologist, and he also happens to be my husband, my better half. I was a TV reporter for 10 years. I'm a journalist. My name is Lauren, and we are co-hosts of the Hidden True Crime Podcast. And we have a great show for you tonight. It's a show that we've, uh, so we have delved in a little bit into the latest Max documentary, the Max uh, streaming documentary called The Truth About Jim. Now, we did do a very brief interview last week with the director of this show, Sky Borgman. Sky Borgman is a friend of ours. John was in her documentary on Netflix called Sins of Our Mother, and she's been to our house a few times. And we were, uh, I, I just want to explain this really quickly. We were so honored to have our first, what is called a screener, meaning that uh, we're asked if we want to pre-screen this documentary, meaning before the public. And it's, it's a really big deal, right, John? Like we were like, wow, you know, <laughs> they're asking if, if we want to pre-screen, it's, it's called a screener, this documentary. And we said, yes. And, and then we were able to interview Sky Borgman, the director, before this was even released to the public the, uh, this week or last week was a, I'm, this last week, it's Sunday. See, so, yeah, my days are all screwed up. And uh, of course, because it was our first screener, we were a little unsure of how much we could actually talk about the actual documentary because it hadn't been released. So a lot of people watched our interview with Sky and were a little bit confused. It was, a, they were like, where's the story? <laughs> what happened in the documentary? Help us understand where you're going with this. But uh, we simply were just trying to respect the fact that this documentary hadn't been released to the public. They gave us so many warnings as to not share the documentary or anything that it just felt a little complicated to, to share a play-by-play. -play. Plus, we didn't want to give too many spoilers. We thought we were giving, uh, we thought it was still a very interesting conversation that we had. And we recommend that interview with Sky Borgman that we did earlier uh, last week, earlier this week. Uh and, uh, it's, it's, it's Sunday. It's, it's Sunday. So it, the interview was on Monday, and then the the documentary itself, the truth about Jim, dropped on Thursday, the fifteenth. So okay, it was it you. was this week. It was this week, but this week's a little confusing with the holiday tomorrow. I think. Thank you. I, yeah, technically Thank tomorrow. You. Technically tomorrow's a new week, but maybe not. I don't know. Depending on how you look at it. So hopefully we'll redeem ourselves and be able to explain right now a little bit more about this documentary. I will say there will be a few spoiler alerts in this show. So if you're one of those people that really, really, really wants to watch the show first, um, please do. And we understand uh, it's, it's on Max Streaming, which you can get a month free membership. There's your tip. Uh, and for those of you that do watch this, it, hopefully this will help make sense of that interview. So we recommend going back to that Sky Borgman interview after this live. Uh, so it, tonight would actually be the prequel. 
right? Is that that would be, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're doing the prequel after the interview, I guess. Yeah. And you know what? We've done a few of those too, because when we started our podcast, we really didn't think that many people would be listening to it. We just thought people that uh, were on Facebook groups interested in the Daybell case would be listening to it. So John and I actually started season one without really telling a detailed story about the Daybell case. And then I had to do a crash course prequel to that as well. So this is just what we do. This is hidden true crime style. We, we dig deep and then we go, Oh yeah, by the way, here's your prequel. <laughs> and so we'll welcome. just on a quick note here, in the interview with Sky, I really didn't get into the background of the offender whose name is Jim Mordecai. And so I, I, I didn't really have time to talk to Sky about that since we were limited to 30 minutes. But we're going to talk about, there are some parallels to Daybell here. No. So, and we'll, we'll be talking about that. So we'll be diving into Jim the background, the little background, the, the sufficient, I think there's sufficient background on Jim Mordecai to make some assumptions, but we'll definitely be looking at that more closely tonight than we did with Sky. Yeah. Special thank you to our incredible moderators that are here helping and dropping links in chat. For those of you that want to join the live chat, hit subscribe. I make it subscriber only to slow it down. And then, and then do you want to share this too? We, we actually feel like with this documentary sky left a lot on the table. And so John has also decided to make the truth about Jim this month's documentary for his book club. And if you're interested in that book club, you can head to patreon.com slash hidden to crime. John does a, a live zoom conversation with all of the book club members, and this is going to be the film. So there is that much to talk about. And we'd love to have a discussion further with all of you. And to clarify, to get give people more specifics, that will be held on February 28th. That's a Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And we will, we'll, you know, I'll be curious to get our gems as feedback on this particular documentary. We're going to talk about it tonight. Obviously, we're going to have some, some, something of a chat, but, but, Let's go further on the 28th with our book club members. So that's what we'll be yes. doing on the, on the 28th at 6 p.m. specific time. Yeah. And our wonderful book club member, Kathleen, says, oh, I didn't know that. Kathleen, neither did anyone else. I just learned about 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> well, the, we're working. Was... <laughs> 2024 is the year we get John a little bit more organized and announcing his book club decisions a little bit earlier, but well, the, in fairness, there was, there, I was going to cover something else, but I wasn't thrilled with that choice. So because this was thrown in our laps, I decided to switch gears. So I think we were going to go, I did announce another show we were going to discuss, but I, I think I, I feel more comfortable going in this direction at this point. He got some backlash with the other show you were suggesting. <laughs> so it might not yeah. have been the best fit, we realized. <laughs> and, and then Ozzy Tad, this is funny too. Ozzy Tad is a book club member from Down Under, hence Ozzy. And uh, you make an appearance, allegedly, according to Dr. John, in this documentary, The Truth About Jim, which we're finally about to talk about. He actually, we were, we were watching and then up popped this, uh, this uh, private investigator from Australia. And John said, wait, there's Tad. Tad's in this documentary. So you make an appearance, Tad, according to John. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not obviously actually Ozzy Tad, no. but she, she reminded me of Ozzy Tad. So, right. okay. so yeah, so I, right. All right. So for all of those wondering, let's lay out what this documentary is about. It begins in Santa Rosa, California in the 70s. John, do you want to take it away or do you want me to be the journalist and take it away? I think so. If you're right, if we're setting the scene, it's Northern California. It's Santa Rosa, California specifically. Jim Mordecai works at Half Moon Bay High School. He's an agriculture teacher. He's also heavily involved in the FFA, which is Future Farmers of America. Those are the areas where he runs across students. In the broadest terms, I think this is a story about 
well, let me let me back up a little bit. So this is a period. This is this is a period that's considered, broadly speaking, to be sort of the heyday of serial killers, right? You've got Ted Bundy. You've got the Zodiac Killer. You've got you've got so many serial killers that are. You've got Charles Manson in the late '60s. Zodiac was late '60s. Also, by the way, you have anyway. Th- there's there's for whatever reasons, there's there's a lot that the 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 the, the culture here is in the seventies apparently is conducive to serial killers, and so that that's sort of the backdrop for the story that it, it occurs in a setting that I don't know I don't know if breeds is the right term, but it's it's a setting that that where many serial killers seem to flourish and exist in the seventies and. And that's sort of the background. And then in into this picture enter Jim Mordecai. He works, as I said, he works at Half Half Moon Bay High School as a teacher. And you have the story of a teacher who, at the very least, grooms and victimizes a number of students, including one of his stepdaughters in particular, with whom he develops a relationship. And so he has this fixation on, in particular, young adolescent females in the school where he teaches, but he tends to be a little abusive. Well, he, he's not that he tends to be. He is abusive outside of that environment as well. That in his marriage, for example, when his wife, his second wife threatens to divorce him. He takes a gun and puts it down her throat and threatens to shoot her. He says to her that he's going to slit the throats of his children. So this, this is someone who's pretty indiscriminately violent, but it, he definitely, his violence definitely has more of a kind of a sexually sadistic component, let's say. And so you have this guy, Jim Mordecai. It's a story about Jim Mordecai told through the step granddaughter Sierra Barter, and she's attempting to uncover a good deal of his past, and she's so she's kind of doing some sleuthing, and she's acting in this investigator role, uncovering Jim, more about Jim Mordecai and details about some of his crimes, details about um, who he might be. Um, and again, you have this this backdrop of serial killers in the 70s. And so there's a lot of questions raised about whether Jim Mordecai might be connected to some of those serial killers. Let's briefly watch the trailer. Really okay, quickly here. sure. <laughs> Name Jim Mordecai. My entire life I have heard... Hopefully that helps set the stage with what you are sharing. Yeah. So, I mean, in short, I I guess if I had to summarize this documentary, it's, it's, so it's, it's not just the story of Jim Mordecai. It's the story of, of family's reaction to Jim Mordecai and how, how Jim Mordecai, how presumably a psychopath impacted generations of a family, how he intimidated this family, how he impacted the family, how he victimized the family. Um, so it's not, it's not just the story of Jim Mordecai. It's the, the ripple effects from, from Jim Mordecai being involved in the life of this family or multiple families and sort of the victimization that occurs because of that. But But the story of Jim Mordecai himself is the story of essentially a sexually sadistic psychopath. I I don't know for sure that that's a diagnosis I would give him, but, but, but let's, for the sake of argument, let's say that, you know, this, this is someone who is deeply troubled. Um, It's the story of a psychopath who potentially a psychopath who grooms and abuses women, especially young adolescent females in the school where he teaches in Northern California, but someone who also fits the profile of an unknown serial killer who resides in the same area around the time that, that 
many of these assaults begin. So in the broadest strokes, I think that's how we describe Jim Mordecai and the documentaries about him and his impact on the community and his impact on the specific family that had to live with him and the damage that that created on this family. That was a great summary. And then it is makes sense that it is called the truth about Jim and the, I think one of the most uh, disturbing parts of this show, the truth about Jim is that I think what they're saying is now that he's dead and that there are so many conflicting opinions, we're going to tell you the truth (laughs) about him, or at least all we can tell you right now, there's still some mystery that exists. I think it's going to be up to the, the true crime community to uncover some of those mysteries or maybe here at hidden true crime because one part of the documentary, and this is something you talk about with sky Borgman during your interview is just how many people, when people start speaking out about this teacher, Mr. Mordecai from this high school, so many people defend him and say he was a good man. He was a kind man, leave him alone. And then we have heard from many hidden gems who knew, who knew Jim Mordecai and some people saying that they are shocked. Other people saying, I knew it. Uh, Thank you to our hidden gems who have reached out. We're going to have one with us later tonight. So stay tuned that new Jim. Right. And, and so actually, so in the, in the documentary, Shannon, who is the stepdaughter of Jim's, who is Sierra Bar- so Shannon Barter is the mother of Sierra Barter who's more or less telling the story here I guess the family's telling the story but Sierra is specifically telling the story so at one point in the documentary Shannon sends out some emails to the community saying hey are any of you have any of you been did you know Jim Mordecai and have you been victimized by him and she gets a lot of negative responses from people that that are really invested in defending Jim Mordecai and people who say, you know, he's deceased, leave him alone. He can't talk for himself. Right. And, and I mean, that that's not unreasonable by the way. I mean, he is deceased. It's hard for him. It would be hard for him to really speak for himself, but it, it was interesting that, it was interesting that the, the community response was the backlash was fairly severe and that many people, in spite of the fact that Shannon and a number of victims had come forward and said, Hey, we were victimized by this guy. He was horrible. Many members of the community in half moon Bay and Santa Rosa defended him strongly, vociferously. They defended him. And, um, and so that was, I think that was a very interesting part of the documentary. And we'll be, Great. and again, we'll be, we'll be talking to someone who knew Jim Mordecai, who attended, was a student at, of Jim Mordecai's and she will be addressing some of those issues as well. Well, in fact, should we, should, do you want to, should we bring her on? Would this be? Yeah, we could bring okay. Kay on really quickly. I want to read Rebecca Randall because it's so very true. Isn't that how predators work? If they didn't have people that love them, they wouldn't be able to victimize. So very, very true. And yet at the same time, don't we see time and time again that those that are the best predators will have people just stand by them until the very end because they just can't believe that this person could be a predator. So you're absolutely right. All right. We have with us Hey, Louise. Kay, can you hear us? And can yes, we hear I can. You? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Let's put you in the middle. Does that work? Okay. There we go. There we go. Kay Louise is a hidden gem who wrote us after watching Sky's uh, interview with us to share about Jim. And, and she wants to stay uh, somewhat anonymous because of many people that she knows that are connected very to many him. very many and and so 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 k is not necessarily your real name but we're going to call you k tonight and 
Kay, tell us a little bit about growing up there and how you know Jim and what you just kind of, what you remember about him. Well, first off, actually, before that, were you shocked to see this documentary? I was, I was shocked, but not surprised because I came home, I missed the live and I came home and I clicked on my little um, bell and I thought I had my phone on airplane mode. I was in a meeting and I came home and I saw the topic and I thought, holy, this is not on HTC. Um, I did know about the trailer. I did know about the posting of Shannon um, in 2021 um, and the rumors. And of course, attending that high school, even before I attended it, I heard rumors. So when I was in grade school and junior high, I heard the rumors. And then when I was in high school, I lived it. So um, very agricultural um, community. I was part of that. A very, um, very tight community in that everybody knows everybody, um, you know, and he was a part of a church in that town. Uh, not the Mormon church. I saw somebody in the chat ask if he was Mormon. He was not Mormon. He was Methodist. Um, but the Methodist church is in downtown Half Moon Bay, very popular. And a lot of his students attended. A lot of the students' parents attended. So he fit right in. He fit right in very well. And everybody thought he was a nice guy. And there was another side to him, a not so nice guy. A guy who would slam students around, male, female, didn't matter. Um, a a, a teacher that allowed alcohol on premises, school pro property. Um, I did not um, participate in FFA, even though I have friends and family that did. Um, future Farmers of America. Future FFA. Farmers of America, right. Um, because I wasn't allowed to. Um, I had a parent that said, no, hell no. <laughs> um, you're not going to be in it. Because That's it. Because of, because of him. Because of Jim. Yep. Because yeah. Yeah. Like, right. Um, and I, I was thankful that in a lot of my time at Half Moon Bay High, I did not have him as a teacher. He was there and he was an advisor in the ad department, but the, the school had brought in other teachers during that time, other ag teachers, new teachers, brand new teachers. Nobody had ever known. So I wonder if there was something going on with him during that period of time. So he'd been there in the 60s. This was the 70s. And um, I can't speak for the 80s, but for the late 70s, he was not always in control of the ag department anymore. Um, I believe he came back after that, after I, I was through in my years. Um, from what I understand, he continued on. But for a, a time, he wasn't in charge anymore. So, Kay, could you, you talked about hearing rumors prior to you attending high school with him. Yes. Could you talk a little bit, what were some of the rumors about him? Uh, he had a temper. He had a very big temper. And when it came out, even in front of students, it was violent. Violent with the animals on the ag farm. Um, There's an ag farm right below the high school. Um, and there was a greenhouse and they raised, um, the students raised sheep. They showed them at fair in Cemetery County. Um, there were pigs raised um, for fair and they would castrate them. And like um, it, it said, he knew how to hog tie an animal and a person. And he would demonstrate that. Um, people were afraid of him. Men were afraid of him. Young men that went to high school were afraid of him there. He would... Um, he would intimidate you. And he intimidated students, like I said, even before I ever got there. I knew he was a force to be reckoned with. You didn't mess with him. And if you did, and he took you in, and he had something on you, he'd use it against you. So you just said something really important there I want to point out. You said the hog tying. I think we, yes. need, we need to, this, this movie, spoiler alert. She talks uh, about it, yeah. Explores the idea that Jim could possibly be the Santa Rosa hitchhiker serial killer. And one of the things that they mention in that is that the victims were hogtied and you are telling us that this was part of who he was. That yes, at you school. Talk a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, because they castrated um, down at the ag farm, and he would, you know, you had to put a pig in a in a hog tie if you wanted castrate it and um same with other animals and i didn't get into the bunnies um the rabbits on the ag farm but i was aware of the pigs um i grew up on a ranch a farm so i always made myself scarce when the anything ha that had to do with the pigs or the hogs i didn't i didn't care for being watching them slaughtered or any of that um so he just took joy in doing those things on the ag farm in front of students. It was almost like a way he could intimidate you um, by showing you what power he had with a knife. You know, there's, there's, there's things that you see on a farm and we were taught in ag, but it, he took joy in it. He enjoyed doing these things and demonstrating them to students. And hey, let me, let me show you how it's done. And you know, I don't, the, the people that I knew were like, heck, Heck no, we're not. We're not going to let him touch us. And um, I was warned: don't go in the greenhouse with him. I was warned. Um, and like I said, thankfully, I did not have as much alone around him time because I had other ag advisors and teachers there, and I even was a part of it. But I didn't, under the umbrella of FFA, join. Um, in fact, people have that thought I. I you know, I joined, but I didn't. I never did because I just didn't want to be around that. Um, the alcohol after FFA meetings that were held at night were a, you know, kids got drunk, kids got in trouble, kids got into a lot of trouble, serious trouble. Yeah. Um, and then with the and he would tie, use it against you if you got caught, you know, it was like, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think that he, there were people that he, if he liked you, he liked you and you were golden, but if he didn't like you, watch out, watch out. So one of the, one thing they mentioned in the documentary was that he apparently had this hobby of, to quote the documentary of quote, slaughtering rabbits. So it appeared that he, you mentioned he, seemed to take some joy in harming animals. Did did you know anything about this this habit of of killing rabbits for no apparent reason? I stayed away from it, John. I, I honestly I even though I've I've seen deer slaughtered, elk slaughtered, I mean I grew up on a ranch and a farm. I mean and I my dad was a hunter, so um it it but he took joy in it. There's there's a difference between hunting or killing something for a purpose and just doing it and getting joy out of it and getting joy out of not just doing it, but watching other people's reactions to doing it. And that's how Jim was. It wasn't just that he was doing it for his pleasure. He wanted to see other people squirm. It, it, that's that's my take on it. It was like, let's see how much I can shock shock the kids or intimidate them or, you know, like if you if you. I think being a female, I don't know. It seemed like he would, he go after the girls, but I think he tried to, in some ways, intimidate the, the guys too, just as much. But if you can show them you have a knife and that you can kill something in front of them, that's, you put the fear in them. Yeah. Right. So well, and, that's, yeah. and that's what I wanted to bring up. You mentioned something specifically again with the hog tying, while that's what you would do with animals he would demonstrate this on some of the students, right? Or, or the, I heard the that he students? asked for volunteers once and wanted dem to demonstrate it. And um, it was bad because if he just grabbed a kid by the throat, which there, there, there was mention of him being physical with students, not just females, males, um, you know, he grabbed you and he had you down on the ground you know, you know, not everybody is big and strong. Not everybody is going to fight back. Um, not everybody's going to go blow the whistle on him because you knew you were going to pay for it. Um, but yeah, he did want to demonstrate things on students and, and, uh, that's why I stayed away from him. I was warned. Yeah. I was told you don't be alone with him and don't get in any situation. And I saw him outside of school. That was the worst part of it for me outside of school was worse than in school with me because at 
certain times I had to be near where he lived and I had to walk by his house and it was very uncomfortable for me. I would go out of my way to go as far away from him as possible if I saw him. Um, he did offer me rides. I am very, very thankful. I never got in a vehicle with him. Um, I trust my gut and I trust my lucky stars and the advice that I was given. And I feel really bad for some people that I, I just feel really bad. I, I know um, some of the things that happened and I just, I'm thankful that I kept my wits about me and avoided him and like the plague. I mean, I avoided that man like the plague off school campus because I knew better. I knew better. Even I would put myself even in danger to avoid going by his house. Go ahead, John. Um, I was just going to ask about when we talked to you earlier, Kay, you were telling us a story about another teacher intervening when yes. he was going to give you a ride. Could you, could you tell us that story again? I had, um, it was quite a ways from where I lived to the high school and you had to go by bus and the bus ride was about a half an hour. And, um, one day I had decided to stay after school for a, uh, extracurricular. Well, it was, it was during school time. They, they, they had a movie at the school. Sometimes there were functions and they would run long and I asked a friend if I could get a ride home. And he was like, yeah, sure. And then he backed out of it. And I, I had missed the bus. And I I had wanted to watch this movie. And I stayed and watched it. And then I didn't have a way home. And the buses, there are no buses after that time that when school gets out. So I was panicking. And he offered to give me a ride. And there was another teacher there. And she intervened. And I trusted her completely. And uh, she said, no, I will give you a ride home. And I was very worried about it because I lived far away from the school. And I didn't want to have them go out of their way. And I was worried and upset. And I thought I was going to get in trouble. You know, you're a kid. This is, you, you got to, you're a teenager. And, you know, I thought I'm going to get in trouble. I missed the bus and all this. And she said, no, even though she lived the opposite direction and far away, a different way, a different direction. She said, I'm going to take you home. And so I did have her take her to, to have her take me to a family member's house. And I didn't take the ride with him. And I have a feeling now, I mean, I sat here and I was talking to my husband. I think she knew. And I think she did not want me to go with him. And she intervened. She said, no, I will take you. And I think she knew. But she couldn't tell me that. And she probably was worried. And... Um, so that was the story of that. So I did not go with him. It wasn't just the students who knew no. about his behaviors, his inappropriate behaviors. It was also apparently the teachers that had some sense for his, what he was capable of. I, I look back now and I think they did know. And I think that, um, gosh, I had teachers that, went to school with family members and I had teachers that taught family members that are of a different generation than I am. So, I mean, I, I always felt comfortable with other teachers. I don't think there was another teacher at that school that I felt that uncomfortable with. I, I know there's not, but, um, that day I, I think I was just so worried about getting in trouble and staying late and missing the bus that I didn't understand why she said no. It didn't dawn on me. I mean, it did It did dawn on me that she she didn't want me to go with him. And I thought, thank goodness, because I, I wouldn't take the ride from him. I would have had to call somebody else to come get me or do whatever. Um, but I think she knew. I, I do think that teacher knew. And I think she stepped in and was very adamant. And when she said no, she meant it. I mean, I'm sure he backed off and he went away, you know, but I think, I think he was looking for opportunities. I do think he groomed students, definitely groomed students. I saw that myself. Um, there were people that he would go out of his way, um, students. I think he did, as Trish said, preyed on girls that maybe came from homes that their family life wasn't that good um, or that there were problems, you know, maybe not a dad figure. 
Um, I agree with that. Um, outside of school, he, he did have some of the communities, like, I don't know, I was talking to my husband again, and, and we were talking about it. And my husband said, I don't think he was as well liked in the community as people perceived him to be. Like, I think there were a lot of parents that did know about him, but nobody spoke up a about it. And the problem wasn't just with the community, it was also with the school. I did hear one of the students say that they went to a counselor um, in the documentary and said, you know, this happened to me. And I probably know exactly who that counselor is. And I walked out of that counselor's office one day and called him a name and I got in trouble for it um, because he didn't listen to anything anybody ever had to say. Um, so I can completely, that's the person that I really feel bad for because she did try and I can, I can believe her 100% because I, I had an experience not with something else, it, you know, not with sexual something, but with something else. And I went to him and he was worthless as far as a counselor. I had other office staff that I went to. Um, with my problem, and it, it wasn't a serious problem like Christie's, but yeah, I just, my heart goes out to her, because when you go to tell somebody and they don't listen to you, that's really bad. So this is, Lauren just posted this picture. This is the picture you provided to us. You had, you had mentioned that Christy is in this picture. Could you? Yes, Christy's in the picture. And Christy is a victim and, and a big part of the documentary. And Christy's in this Correct. photo. And Mr. Mordecai, or as we called him, Mordecai, has his arms folded. And I told you in this picture, um, he's angry. I can tell you that right now. Just the way he's posed, if you zoom in on his face, he's not happy. And his arms folded like that, he's got his arms really tight. I mean, his jacket's dressed, you can see. He's yeah. probably not happy. And I... I, when I looked at the picture, I thought he's probably mad because Christy's not right next to him because he kept Christy very tight. And Christy's in the middle of her friend smiling, um, squished in there, little Christy. And he's probably really ticked off at her. That's my theory. So just to clarify yeah. who Christy is, Christy is the stepdaughter. stepdaughter, right? And And the documentary explains that Christy was abused by Jim for a few, at least two years between the ages of 13 and 14. And the abuse began going, getting back to the greenhouse. The, the abuse began apparently in the greenhouse, but continued afterwards. I have I don't another. Know if it began there or not, but, um, uh, I know it might have ended in the greenhouse, actually. It might have okay. started at home and, and ended the day he did that at school, on school property. Okay. My, at, to my thought, to what I think, but I'm, I'm not positive. It, this is all my opinion. So. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this is you another, another shot. We had, um, we had what was called donkey basketball put on by the Future Farmers of America. And if you see, he has a student by the neck. Um, I have firsthand witness with my eyes him literally pull students to the ground off those donkeys. I think eventually though that was not allowed um, because there was abuse to the students and the donkeys, um, which isn't, you know, I'm making a joke of it and this is not a funny subject, but it was just so like, it was just so ridiculous that he was, he would be violent in these, these like, you know, it was just to make money for the future farmers and, you know, everybody would come and he, he'd take it seriously. Could you, could you explain why he was pulling kids or why, why was he pulling students off the donkeys to the ground? Was he? He didn't, I, in this picture, um, I think he did not want this kid and I know who it is to make the shot with the basketball. So he was going to stop him by pulling him off the donkey. By the neck, which okay. I don't think is legit. I mean, I don't, I don't ever, I don't ever remember seeing any other teachers being that rough. So, in other words, that he's 
he's on the other team and he's trying to stop the students. It was the teachers like, versus the students. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. And it, it was oh, FFA okay. members. Yeah. I see. So, all right. I, I didn't understand. Okay. So yeah. gotcha. that makes yeah. sense. And, and he was, so he was in these competitions. He would literally pull students from the donkeys onto the ground in a, in a somewhat, it, you know, aggressive manner. It has to be somewhat aggressive to do that. Yes. And nobody seemed to care. Um, oh, well, they're just, you know, being guys, it's a sport. It's, you know, a lot of things got overlooked. A lot of things. I think in today's time, this would never happen, John. I really, truly think that a lot was overlooked. Farming community, small town, you know, everybody's having fun. It's, you know, I don't think everybody did have fun. I know there were students who did not have fun. I, like I said, I saw it for years, not just the years I went to school there, but when I was there at other gatherings before I was in high school. So it just, um, I think as far as the violence with him, he was very physically violent and he couldn't keep his hands to himself, you know, either with the girls and with the boys, he was rough. I do have another friend who felt physically intimidated by him when he would stand by him. He would stand by a, a, a male student. Um, that male student felt uncomfortable um, and he would seek out people that he he wanted to help per se he he told this person i'll help you you know i'll help you get a good grade you can do special projects you know um if you wanted that a you could get it even if you didn't study so that was kind of known wow um overall you know you've been talking to many people now that you grew up with Overall, right. what's the consensus of this documentary? What are people saying? What's the word out on, on the street for those that grew up in Half Moon Bay? Most everybody is shocked that um, had him, that liked him, and that did good. And he did do a lot of good for the ag farm. I mean, he wanted it to prosper at our high school. Um, but there, there's the underlying, the kids that, yeah, he was angry. Yeah, he could be mean. Yeah, he would intimidate. Yeah, you know, it's coming out the more that um, I think people were waiting. I because I saw I saw a lot on social media about pre documentary, and then today I read the post documentary posts. Now people are kind of seeing it, and I think that okay. the generation that's um, the 80s is very different than the 70s. And I think for the mm. the 60s too, because in the late 60s, he was new there. He was, he, he hadn't gotten his, um, he, he had to work at becoming a good teacher and building a rapport in the community and doing, you know, he had to, he had to start somewhere. By the 70s, he was very comfortable. He was very comfortable and he was very cocky. And I think that it stood out. And by the eighties, he even got more confidence in himself and what he could do and what he could get away with, but he didn't get away with it forever. And for those wondering the, the, the killings that people have suspected he may possibly have played a part in or, or been the killer happened in 72 and 73. Is that right, John? Eight, right. eight there girls. Were eight girls there were Young girls. eight yes eight females identified as victims that were their bodies were essentially thrown in ditches they were hogtied hog most of them were hogtied they were assaulted prior to being thrown in the ditches um on the hogtied part by the way i should mention that his Two of his biological children, Jamie and Melissa, and his two of his stepkids, um, Michael and Christy, talked about in the documentary, they talked about how he would, when he was frustrated or angry, he would tell them, I'm going to hog tie you and throw you in a ditch. In other words, he, rut he routinely apparently talked about this idea of hog tying people and throwing them in a ditch, which is precisely, and again, I don't know, you know, this this doesn't prove anything. This is still speculation, but, but 
he would say that to his children in a threatening manner that he would hogtie them and throw which is which is what happened to these eight victims who all were found within close proximity to that area and he actually had a cabin so he had kind of the proverbial cabin in the woods type thing um that he would go to it was a family cabin that was very close, fairly close to where many of the victims were discovered. So, um, and again, that, you know, this doesn't prove anything, um, but it certainly raises a lot of questions. And there, there is now a DNA, there is now a reliable DNA profile available on Jim Mordecai. And there is yes. DNA, there is existing DNA from the Santa Rosa Hit, presume Santa Rosa hitchhiker killer that's out there. The Sonoma police department has this information. As far as we know, they haven't sent anything in for testing. I don't know why <laughs> for me personally, just for the sake of justice and just to know potentially the identity if if, if it is Jim Mordecai or whether it is or isn't from my perspective, it seems like a no brainer to me that they would they would consider running the DNA analysis and seeing if it's a match. Um, I think in particular for the eight victims that like that have never had justice and um, they're kind of just out there. Um, These were children, young teens, young teenage girls. So were the victims that have never They look like just the students in Half Moon Bay High. They look like the typical long-haired blonde, you know, dirty blonde, feather, fair uh, hair, you know. I mean, um, yeah. They they those any of those girls in Santa Rosa or that area could have been the same girls that I went to school with. And if you look at all his victims, they're very similar looking. Um, I in high school looked the same way. <laughs> so yeah. uh, Kay, I have a question. I, I want to go back to something you said that was really interesting to me, to me that before the documentary came out, uh, people were kind of torn that you grew up with, you know, seeing they, they saw the trailer and they were, there was a bit of back and forth, not so much. And then the documentary came out and people are sort of seeing the truth. I think they want proof. I, I want to ask you about that, but I also find it incredible in a positive way that the, that sunlight, like truth will set you free. Like these vi many victims came forward. And so I think there's see, more victims. I do. I, do I think too. that people are very afraid to speak out because just like, I don't want to show my face. I grew up in that town. I, there, there could be stigma over where you lived, who you were, who your parents were, what your parents did for a job. I mean, you know, I mean, there's so much judging that, I completely agree with Shannon. I saw her in the video say, I saw that post she put in 2021 on Facebook. I did. I saw it. And maybe that wasn't the platform in a reunion setting or how, whoever, all the posts. I think she reached out to where she could reach out. And some people were offended by it because that's not what it was about. But I think she was trying to reach mass. So I got it in one respect. But there are always going to be people, the people that did well under him, the people that thought he was a good guy that are going to stick up for him. And that's because they never saw the other side of him. He could, somewhere in the documentary, it said he could either be charming and the nicest guy in the world, or he could be a complete jerk. I'll, and I'm cleaning that up for YouTube. So, yeah. So, so but, but, you know, so what she's referring is to true. is Shannon. Well, all the people that thought he was all good, that didn't see the bad side of him, which if you were around him for very long, you would see the bad. I, I have a friend that I've known all my life. I went to school with him all my life and they were, he was actually really good friends of the family. And he said, well, Jim did have a temper, but that's it. And I'm like, really? You, you know what? We've gone through all of school and that's all you can say is he had a temper. Did you, were you blind? But I think that that's kind of the thing that there are people who just didn't think it or want to say it, or I don't, I'm not quite sure why there are so, well, I do know why there's a division. I think there are people who are just downright scared and you wanted to get through school. You wanted to graduate. You didn't want to have problems. Um, you had siblings under you. I, I mean, even within a family, people didn't tell. 
So people in a school aren't going to tell. And if they are strong enough to tell and they're not listened to, that tells you a lot. You know, when adults don't listen to kids and it's, oh, you know, fuck it up or suck it up, you know, it, you know, don't take those classes if you can't handle it. I mean, I've, I can hear it now, you know, just in the back of my mind, don't whine about it. Don't, don't take the ag if you don't want to, you know, and then there's the, the groups in high school, there's the, the jocks, the sports, there's the band kids, there's, you know, all these groups. So everybody had a, a different take on it. And I did see that in the, in the comments and the, and the kind of the feedback. Some people didn't even know who he was you know, because they never hung out in that environment. The ones who I think felt the strongest pro for him were the FFA members that were placed in leadership positions and were made sure that they got treated well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even Jim Mordecai's uh, wife in the end stood by him until his death when he died of cancer. Uh, so, you know, I think not stand by him. manipulating people, very, very good much manipulating so. people, very much so. And that's the thing to point out too, is these type of people also manipulate those closest to them, including their spouses. Uh, and I think he knew how, who, who, who to stay away from too, because I mean, there are some parents that would have never put up with this, mine being one of them. And I think he knew that. And, you know, I think he stayed away from certain kids. I think he protected certain kids if he knew there were parents that were super super involved and that were there on campus there were there were other students whose parents worked on campus i'm sure those kids never had a problem with him because they would have went to their parents so i think he was he was very calculating and he was very manipulative and he could act like the nicest guy but underneath there was to me and I went with my gut. I felt like he was, you know, ready to explode. And I saw him explode a few times with anger and with frustration. And you could even tell just, just if you were in the same room with him, you could tell his mood. You could tell if he was uptight and like the, uh, like that picture with the arms folded and the look on his face, like he was, you know, and he gave you the eye, like, you know, you knew, you knew. Yes. Someone mentioned that his wife was afraid of him. And I want to point that out too. It's true. His wife was afraid of him. Uh, analytical says for Kay Louise and the rest of the guests coming on as students, my teacher heart breaks for you. You should have never experienced this, especially from an entrusted adult. I am so sorry. You are loved. Dr. John, anything you want to say right now? I've been starring a bunch of uh, comments and questions as well. I haven't been watching the chat as much because I'm listening and paying attention. As a dam, I, I never thought I would be talking to you or, or John because, um, you know, I followed Daybell and Petito. And lately I've been listening to the um, Adam Montgomery, Harmony Montgomery trial. And I never ever thought I would be addressing this with you guys. And it's sad that I have to be talking about this subject. But if anything, I'm thankful that the family all came together in the end and they're free of him. He's gone. He can't hurt anybody anymore. But I can't help but think of the generations of kids that he taught and he had an impression on. And thankfully, I didn't get in a vehicle with him. I avoided him like the plague and I was not bullied by him. I do know people who were horribly bullied by him mm -hmm. and I do think that affected them. And I, I think that it affected their relationships and it's sad because if that went on from the late sixties or mid sixties, all the way into the mid eighties, that's 20 years. And he had an influence on a lot of kids. And if there's other survivors out there of his sexual abuse and they're just afraid to come out and talk about it because they're afraid of the backlash. It's sad. It's sad that 20 years down the road or 30 years down the road, it's only now coming out. So as a gem, I'm glad that there's this place where we can talk about it. And um, it's just, it's yeah. just it's yeah. mind blowing that it can go on and nobody did anything about it or suspected. I, I do think people knew. I, I really, truly do think people knew. 
Mm-hmm. And eventually he became gone and retired. He didn't retire out from what I understand, but he didn't come yeah. back. John, did you want to say something to this? To Kay? Do you, Kay, do you have an opinion on whether you believe that Jim Mordecai is the Santa Rosa hitchhiker killer? I think he very well could be. And I grew up in that era. I grew up walking, being afraid of vans. Um, he had a van. He had a truck. He had a car. Um, he had, I you don't said know he switched his cars is. a lot. That was what, something you told us. He, he had a lot of vehicles. Um, and in fact, other students that that I've heard from have said that when later after I was gone from high school, but later um, when his girls were older, the cars would be driven by like the daughters or their friends. And I, you know, I, he was always so uptight about all those kind of things. I, I, yeah, I don't know about the vehicles unless he had family members and borrowed them or what, but he seemed to always have, like I said, he had a truck, he had a car and I'm pretty sure he had a van. Um, And like we've talked about it, it was Manson, it was the Zodiac, it was the Santa Rosa, it was the Golden State. There were a lot of things to be, you know, and we had, um, we had actually an incident in Half Moon Bay at one time with the Hells Angels and they hung out for a couple days. Um, They could take over a town. And um, I had, I had siblings that were pretty mean. They would scare me and tell me, oh, we're going to give you away to the Hells Angels. Um, So you know, it was a scary time. And I think that he had the opportunity. He definitely had the personality and the instability to do things like that. He could, I listened to Shannon as she was talking about him driving in Santa Rosa with her when the night that she took um, her daughter and left Judy and Jim's house, um, that he could change, you know, he could be really like just normal and then get really angry. Like at, Something very simple, like you just, you know, you you knocked over a picture of water in the greenhouse and all of a sudden he was like zero to a hundred angry. You know, like you, you're like, it's not a big deal. It's just going to sink into the ground. It's okay. It's just water, you know. In fact, the, the, the documentary does a good job of, of pointing that out. In fact, there's a, there's a story where Shannon... <clears throat> Well, Shannon, Shannon tells the story that she left home after she went on a ride. She was 15 years old. So Shannon is the stepdaughter of Jim Mordecai. She went on a drive with him. He started speeding and he was, he was in kind of an, to her, it seemed like he was in an altered state. She feared for her life. Mm -hmm. She recognized later that he was speeding around the area where one of the, the victims of the Santa Rosa hitchhiker killer was, was placed that it was around that area that he started kind of losing control and he was becoming angry and he was sort of out of his mind of sorts. And she was able to, what for, I don't know how she did it, but she was able to snap him out of that and to get him to go home. And when she came home after that ride, she talked to her mother, Judy, and she said, I'm not, I will not live around this man anymore. And that's when she left. Right. And I think there's another um, one of his daughters, these these his two daughters, but with Judy, um, not not with Judy, with Janae, his two daughters with Janae, one has dark hair, one has light hair, Um, Jamie and I forget the other one. They were like little. One was like a baby and one was a toddler at the time um, that I was around him. Um, And one of them said that she could talk her dad down. I, I'm surprised because I saw him get angry at over nothing, you know, for just silly stuff. I'm, I'm thankful. Like, you know, he didn't, go, I, I think he did go off. I think he did physically like, you know, punch things and throw things and, but you know, in a school environment, it's totally different than if you're in your own home and you want to do things like that. So I don't know. I, I, I struggle with saying he's, he's the killer, but I think that he's totally capable of being the killer. So I would think that somebody needs to investigate and look into this a lot more further. He had opportunity. He had knowledge of the area in Santa Rosa. I think that 
the timeline with divorces and him being frustrated with probably his life. Um, I never knew about his football career that got ruined by him, um, you know, um, having to be get, get married. Um, but that makes sense to me. I did notice that if there were couples in high school, he didn't like that. He didn't like, like if a, a, a girl had a boyfriend and they were a couple, he didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. He would try to cause problems and, you know, um, no D of A, we called it D of A, no displays of affection. Um, that was a big deal, big, big deal, you know? Yeah. Huge. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So he, he became angry when students would. Yeah. Show. Make out in the quad or do whatever, you know, hold hands. He didn't want any of that. No displays of affection. Yeah. That was interesting. That is really yeah. interesting. No. John's I mean, nodding. I kind John's of think back. I kind of is nodding. <laughs> I'm like trying to put myself back in that time frame and like see what, you know, what brought it up was when you guys, we were talking about him getting angry. I was trying to think of, I, I saw him angry. Why did I see him angry? And that was one of, I mean, not one many times I'd see him get angry over kids holding. I mean, and we're in high school, kids hold hands. They, but you know, I go back to looking at the documentary and Christy saying, I was not allowed to date. I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend. I wasn't allowed to go to parties. I don't even know, you know, um, I saw her in like a, a long gown and I thought, I wonder if she even went to dances. Dances were a big thing at Half Moon Bay High. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a social thing. So, but he got, he would get very angry over kids holding hands or, you know, hugging or, you know, there's pictures in our yearbooks um, for dinner, you know, for not just my time in high school of, you know, kids holding, you know, hugging or, I mean, sometimes it didn't even have to be a girlfriend or a boyfriend. If you just went and hugged somebody, cause you know, whatever, it, not a big deal, but he did not like that. He did not like that. Yeah, so that, John, that I saw, yeah, go ahead. What do you think of that? Because you're, you, that got your attention and you're the psychologist here. The, the lack of saying well, no I, to I, my first, PDA. my first reaction is that there's, almost a sense of entitlement that, you know, in some ways perhaps he feels like the female students are his property. Hmm. That It's okay yeah. for him. It's okay for him to do something inappropriate with them, but not, you know, similar age students. Hmm. That somehow I, it feels like it, this is just my first impression. It feels like there's a bit of a threat that I think he saw many of the, the, the female students as, somehow his that there's almost a sense of entitlement. So that that's my first impression the other would be my other reaction to that would be, it would clearly have something to do with his own insecurities about his masculinity and his own sexuality, which obviously, so there's a projective component, his own insecurities about his own sexual prowess and his own masculinity that, you know, he's, he's engaging in a lot of crimes that have to do with that. So I think that could be another component. I think Dr. John is very wise. <laughs> very, very wise. Thank you, Kay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I literally, after I watched, I binge watched the documentary and I sat here and thought I would love for Dr. John to, do a psychological profile on him because I truly think he was a Jekyll Hyde. And I said that to my husband, I said, he was a Jekyll Hyde. And my husband said, you're right. And I tend to be descriptive. And he said, that's a good way to describe him. My husband did not like him. Um, Mr. Mordecai, he didn't um, have any interaction with him but he didn't like him. And that's funny because my husband's pretty easygoing guy and likes pretty much everybody. So, but he had no interaction with him in high school whatsoever at all. So, but he did know who, know who he was. So um, when I said he was a Jekyll Hyde, my husband said, I think you're, you're spot on. Yeah. I, so with you that know, being said, John, I mean, that's a question ultimately I'll let you answer, but c could you give us a bit of a profile? of him as much as you can you'll never be able to meet him yeah the, there's 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 little clues that are dropped throughout the documentary i don't know there's probably 
fewer clues than I would like to have seen, but mm-hmm. there is there is one mention of his mother, Evelyn. And Evelyn is described by apparently by one of the daughters that knew her. She was described as quote angry and cruel. I thought that was interesting that, you know, um, I, you get the sense that that his mother was very dismissive of him and probably somewhat rejecting, but at the very least, to have a mother who's angry and cruel a lot, he's 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 taking on a lot of those qualities. He's he's not only does he feel my guess is, and again, I, I can't go too far with that type of a tidbit. It's not it's not giving me a lot of detail, but I it's think some- you're you're on the right track though, because um, when he probably graduated high school and had a full ri- ride to UCLA, I believe, and he got his girlfriend pregnant, his parents probably, and especially mother, wasn't too happy with him. And then I heard the girls also say that later in life, um, that made him angry. It, he he felt. I think him, I forget if it was Janae or Judy saying that that he was really angry about that. He he was Judy with or he was angry with uh Janae, the second wife. I remember her the most. I don't remember Judy the third wife at all. I I remember his second wife Janae. Um he was angry with her until he died. He carried a lot of anger <laughs> in him. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it but, appears but the to be mother angry. thing. I bet his parents were not too happy with him. Um, they they said that they made him get married to his first wife. Yeah, there's there's some implication that he blamed his first wife for losing his scholarship, and he does appear to have a lot of anger toward obviously to, towards women in particular, and his. His behaviors would suggest that if he is the Santa Rosa hitchhiker killer, then obviously that's taking that that hatred towards women to a different level. That would be pure misogyny <laughs> at the very least. Kay, thank you so much for being here. Is there anything else that you'd like to share, Kay, or anything else, any other questions you have for Kay before she leaves and she can join us on YouTube <laughs> so she can watch <laughs> where she's probably used to it? Thank you, Linda. I think those are those are probably most of my questions. I have yeah. one for you. I, you know, there's a part in the documentary. I forget which part it is, but it's when the his two daughters by Janae are small, and um, she's with a friend in a car, and he goes to that car with the kids in his vehicle, and he gets out and he beats the man in the other vehicle with Janae in the car and the little girls are in the car. One of them was only like two. Um, and he comes back into the, his vehicle with blood, this man's blood on him. Um, he got away with that. Yeah. <laughs> and that seems to me like he got away with a lot like that. And that's another thing that shows me he was blood violence. It just didn't phase him like normal people. I just, Right. There were, right. There weren't a lot of constraints to his behavior, but yeah, that, that is an interesting moment. So that just to clarify it, I think that was around the time that that was, it sounds like that was shortly after Janae divorced him and Janae, by the way, initiated the divorce. Right. So he felt rejected. Janae was apparently dating someone else. And that's when he, 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 he knew where she was with this person that, she was with and that's when he assaulted the person right isn't that the is that the that's the story i got right he would he he would assault people <laughs> and and i i just i don't understand how he he always got away with it like even with students that's the thing like yeah and that that story by the way i so if in in trying to understand jim mordecai i think that's a really interesting story. I wasn't thinking about that. So thanks for reminding me, Kay, but the, You're welcome. this, this idea of there's kind of this, this underlying motif with him of, of damaged masculinity. 
that, you know, he's violence is a way for him to, to compensate for this underlying sense of damaged masculinity. It's a way to repair himself. Right. And, and that story, I think all like the, one of the common themes here is that this guy feels with women, he feels very threatened and emasculated. And um, mm. some of that could be his mother. Some of that could be his first wife, his second. I, I don't know exactly. I don't know the details, but, but clearly when, when you're divorced from someone and, and in this case, Janae, a second wife, and she starts dating someone and you can't, you get to the point where you're so threatened by that, that you find out where she is on that date and you assault him to the point where that person is unconscious or near unconscious. Right. And you somehow gloat over that. That's, and you have your two young kids in the car. Right? Yeah, the kids in that's, the car with you. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, in, that's, that's, I don't know. That's so far beyond anything, anything that would be considered normal. It wasn't normal. And I think that even his little girls, he made the one, you know, call her, her mom and say, I, I hate you. I hate you. And she didn't want to do it. I think that's the kind of power he had, even over his own small children. Um, they were intimidated by him, just like some of his students. And, you know, I don't know why other adults, maybe they didn't see it or they didn't want to see it. Maybe other teachers. I'm thankful for the one teacher that told me, no, you're not, you know, I will take you home. I'm glad I didn't get in the car. I'm glad I never got in the car with him in the neighborhood when he wanted, when he offered a ride. I'm glad I never, ever got in a car with him. So um, that I, you know, I, I think that the Santa Rosa Police Department really, really, really need to test their DNA. Yeah, and I'm hoping that happens. I think it's with the Sonoma Police Department, but yeah. Oh, I, Sonoma. Okay. I, I like you. I, I would make a plea right now, and I, you know, the, the, our, our gems that have been watching us for years, they know that we. Re I never make pleas, but I would make a plea to the the Sonoma Police Department to please. The, I don't know how much evidence, more evidence they need, but you know, to to please do this DNA analysis because it seems to me there's a fairly high probability here that this is the guy. <laughs> it's funny too, that they were going to kind of try to, I think, link him to the Zodiac. Zodiac was different, but then Zodiac changed and said he was going to change his way of what his killings. Um, yeah. I, you yeah. know, we don't know why killers do the things. Well, we, we try to figure it out why they do the things they do, but the ones in Santa Rosa were definitely, or in that area, Berryessa, um, that area, were sexual. They were young girls. Um, so I I can't say that I think he wouldn't do that. I, I, I can't say that I I think he's capable of it. Yeah, the, the Zodiac, I think the, the, the Zodiac portion of this documentary was was very interesting. I, I, I thought it was a little bit of a stretch maybe. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. the argument they're making, or at least Sierra is making, is that if it's Jim, if Jim Mordecai is the Zodiac killer, that he changes his MO, he changes his modus operandi to, he goes from killing for the sake of killing to then getting into more sexual crimes. And so the argument that, that that she tries to make is that if it is the Zodiac killer, that the Zodiac killer evolved. So the Zodiac killer. Well, the, the Zodiac killer stopped too. So we yeah. we don't know why he stopped all of a sudden. I mean, it was pretty, you know, he was out there for a bit and then he stopped. And so we don't know why that either. Yeah. You know, uh, on that issue, by the way, so, they bring in this Zodiac expert, his name's Mike Butterfield. And he, he essentially says what I think what I would say, which is that Zodiac didn't really, his motives didn't appear to be sexual. In other words, so they weren't sexual crimes per se. And that's not to say that again, like, like Sierra says in the documentary, that's not to say it could have, his MO could have changed, but um, it does seem like that, with Zodiac, at least, I don't know, for those familiar with, with the movie Zodiac, um, and it's a 
portrayal of the you know the zodiac crimes and suspects but really there's only been one suspect and that's arthur allen lee and um and you know there are there's a zodiac profile there's a dna profile of the zodiac killer as well so um i don't know why they haven't tested or they haven't maybe they don't have any dna from from arthur allen lee but um it seems like the Zodiac is definitely much more of a stretch. The Santa Rosa killer, uh, you know, it's in his backyard, right? There's the cabin right there. Uh, there I don't know. There's the hog tie. The hog tie component to me is so compelling. I don't, I don't that know. That was his anyone. thing. Yeah, he, he really had a thing for it. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree 100%. I don't know anyone who talks about hog tying, but you know that I guess we don't live in an agricultural community. You know what? I don't think it's a normal thing. thing. Too. What? <laughs> it was. Go ahead, Kay. I was just going to say I don't think it's a normal thing anywhere. I mean, you know, I mean, I've I've been in other states where they, you know, are around cattle and stuff. I I mean, you do have to hobble and do things to you know horses and cows to do certain veterinary functions and things to them, but it's not something that you go around talking about all the time. And this man was like fascinated with it. Like he was, it was his thing. Like That's even a student. Sky Borgman too. Sky Borgman, the director said that also got her that, that hog tying situation. Yeah. Uh, I, I just can't get past it's not, that. It's not, it's too coincidental. I'll put it that way. Agree. Okay. Thank you so much for. You're welcome. Us. Thank you guys. And thank you, Dr. Yeah. John, because you made me, um, you helped me see the psychological angle and I was, that's something that I was trying to figure out. I like to figure that out. And I was thinking there's even a part in the documentary that says that he was probably abused, that that's yeah. how he became an abuser. And I think that's probably true. Yeah. Unfortunately. Right. It, it, it wouldn't be surprising to, to think that his parents could have been abusive towards him. In fact, I one of in the documentary the, the exact quote they use is they quote he he played out his pain and rage on all his victims. And I, I agree with that. So where does his pain and rage come from? It could come from a traumatic past or at least certain traumas from his past that we you know, we may never know about now, but, but that seems highly likely. Thank you, Kay, so much. And You're for welcome. those of you, and Thank your you. name, her uh, Kay's YouTube name is Kay Louise. So when you go see her on uh, YouTube, many people are saying that you hope you see this chat later. I'm sure you will because you're off. I'm going to try to go back through it. Sometimes it disappears and then I won't see it, I think, but I'm going to try to look back through it really quickly. Yeah. And you can go jump back on it now. I'm going to ask John a few more questions. So come join okay, us over in chat. Thank you. Kate. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks, Kay. Night. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Um, so so I, I teased a some Daybell parallels, and we, I have to get back to those. Okay. Okay. Please. So I, one of the most interesting parts of this documentary, and I, I didn't, talk about this with Sky, by the way. So we're we're talking much more about Jim Mordecai here than I did with Sky. If so if people are interested, my interview with Sky was more about the family and the impact on families and victims. So um so please check that out if you want to hear about that. But so some of the interesting Daybell parallels are so here's some things that we know about Jim Mordecai as well that he would often get into these dissociative states where he would talk in tongues. So that, you know, there, there does seem to be this dissociative component to Jim Mordecai that he would, people talked about snapping him out of his anger or snap, like that he would get into this other personality or frame of mind um, yes. that would, that would be just completely focused on whatever his goal was. And, and oftentimes that might be violence or aggression, but, um, but this, this talking in tongues would be, would be related to that. So he would get in kind of this religious state where, or spiritual state where he would 
talk in tongues. Um, he would consider himself in those moments to be on a higher spiritual plane. So, and his, his two of his, his kids, Melissa and Jamie talked about how Melissa in particular, I think if I'm, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong here, but um, that on multiple occasions, she would, he would, one time he came into her room and he was kind of in this dissociative state and he asked her, do you feel my power? And this seemed to be a theme of his. He would ask people, do you feel my power? And she said that if she questioned it, that she felt like he might get aggressive. So she said, yeah, of course, of course I feel your power. You know, you're so powerful. Now, you know, get out of here and leave me alone. Right. But there's this thing about feeling his power. He also believed in exorcisms. So this is where the day ball part comes in. He believed in exorcisms. He would actually talk about exorcisms in his classes. So some of the students would, he would, so this is an agriculture class. I don't know how that would be relevant to exorcisms, but he would bring it in. He believed in exorcisms. He believed in demons. And again, he would talk about those in class. So he, he was widely known to talk about these themes around exorcism and demons and and again, this another kind of Daybell component here. He had this Messiah complex. This was a term they used in the documentary. I'm not assigning this label to him. <laughs> Just so they talked about that he believed he was the Messiah, and that he believed he was Moses reincarnated. So again, uh, shades of Daybell, right? The demons, the exorcisms, the Messiah thing, the past. Not just, say, not just Daybell, but. Jody Hildebrandt, right. Tim Ballard, you know, similar. Yes. Grandiose. Right. The, the grandiosity, there's this grandiosity. There's almost this psychotic feature here that when he's in these, let's, let's call them dissociative states, he's sort of losing his grasp of reality to some degree. So there's, there's something almost psychotic about that. If not psychotic, if not, I don't think, I'm not sure if it's full-blown psychosis, but he's on the edge of reality in many of these situations. Um, and all those, by the way, would be risk factors for somebody that could potentially murder a number of young adolescent females. So you have all of those elements. You also have this, which this is a, a feature of psychopaths in particular is this idea. He's very callous. He lacks mm -hmm. empathy. He has no ability to really connect to other human beings, or at least to connect emotionally on a meaningful level. And he doesn't understand people's emotions. So there's this element, I think that we see in many psychopaths of callousness um, that he seems to exhibit. So I, I think I, I think those are all so if I'm trying to paint a picture of Jim Mordecai, it's not it's not just this uneasy relationship with with women, but it's also it goes beyond that. You have I think you have potentially with him kind of these dual risk factors. So in forensic psychology, oftentimes we might divide offenders or perpetrators into camps that would be is someone more a psychopath or is someone more psychotic? And in many cases, when those two blend, when you blend kind of psychotic features with psychopathic features, then the risk could be even greater because not only are you losing touch with reality, but you're losing touch with reality in a way. For a minute. Can you just lay down and close your eyes for a second? We'll watch a movie later. Oh, could you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, I heard that. Um, now I don't hear you. Your your mic's off. Okay. I turned it on. I turned it on. No. No. Nope, that was go. supposed no, to be fine. muted. The one no, that fine. wasn't muted was supposed to be muted, and so okay. apologies. <laughs> so I real I, life hashtag real life. Okay. I hope I hope the youngest member of our audience didn't hear all that, but no, uh, I have. Okay. I have my yeah. earphones okay. in. That's good. There's a reason oh. John talks the most. <laughs> yeah. But. Um. So I I was just saying that that when you combine 
some of these psychopathic tendencies like callousness ness with um with more psychotic features that that the risk for this type of thing for very violent crimes would might tend to go up Um, can I read to you some of the questions we have? Sure. Or, or, or keep going with the, I love it. Thank you. I think Sorry, that's, I, got a little I, can, I think with given what we learned in the documentary, they don't feature his background that much. It's not, I think the, the, and again, I would recommend that people go to the sky interview. I talk more with sky about what I think the main focus of the documentary is, which is it's about, a fractured family and how this family repairs itself and how they don't, you know, she's not trying to discover this answer to the question of who is the Santa Rosa hitchhiker killer. That's not the focus. And I, by the way, I think, I think there's probably going to be people frustrated by the fact that the, the main focus is not on answering that question. The main focus is on uh, family relationships and, intimate relationships and families and how you repair them. So keep in mind that Judy, who's the one married, Judy Mordecai is married to Jim. Judy essentially, so Shannon, Judy's daughter essentially leaves Judy at age 15 and their relationship is completely damaged. And as Shannon says, of her mother that she engages in toxic positivity and can't see through this guy, Jim. And so they, their, their relationship is fractured for many, many years. They have no relationship. And so part of this process by Sierra, who's Shannon's daughter is to try to repair some of the damage that's been done by Jim. And it's effective by the way. So the family does come together. Thank you, Stephanie May, for posting the interview with film director Sky Borgman about this latest Max documentary. I'll also put that in the description of this video as soon as this is done. Uh, John, I have one question for you. Uh, okay. I've been starring some really interesting questions. I can't ask them all now, but people know who can hear me. But this one, I think, is uh, a really great question when it comes to people like Jim Mordecai, I think one of the most interesting thing that is always, I always go back to for me is how some people can, how, uh, how a perpetrator can fool so many people. And yet some people can see something. Krista Gardner asks, when do we trust our intuition? Honest question. Hmm. That's right. I, um, well, I, I think part of the, part of the answer is how finely tuned are our intuitions to, to, um, in particular to emotion. So I think if, if you feel like your intuitions are good about other people and their emotions, then I would trust it. If you feel like your intuitions are not particularly good, if you have a history of, difficulties in relationships and you're not particularly good at reading other people's emotions or affect, then I, perhaps I would trust that intuition less. But I, so I think, I think that the, for example, with Kay, our guest, she feels, she, she obviously senses and understands and feels this underlying anger that he has, that Jim has. And so She's not, she trusts that intuition because she knows that that's real. And she doesn't, she's afraid of that anger. She's not going to get in the car with this guy because she knows that there's something there, that there's potentially something menacing in that anger that she needs to avoid. So I think, I think it's, it's a tricky question to answer, but part of it is, are your intuitions tuned to other people's emotions in such a way that you trust that intuition. Yes. Thank you. I, I might add Krista that our intuitions can improve when we learn about things like red flags. Um, the more we learn, the better our intuitions are. 
and the more we can trust them. And so I think learning about red flags and pointing those out, which John, you've always done for us. Thank you. Can improve our intuitions. Yeah. And also, you know, there's, there's other variables in play with intuition. So if you take uh, Judy Mordecai, who's married to Jim, that she's described by her daughter as having this toxic positivity. You know, I, I think when you, when there's this, and I don't know, I, I, I'm a little hesitant to call toxic positivity an um, ideological component, but let's let's call it that for the sake of argument. When you have sort of this ideological element to how you see the world, it's going to be harder to really look, to drill down and, and look at some of the finer elements of other people, or it's going to be harder to trust intuition because everything is going to be filtered through that lens of toxic positivity. So like with Judy, the implication is because, because she cannot see any negative in other human beings, she will be incapable of seeing that in Jim. And she has to learn it's through, it's through the documentary and through this process that Sierra undertakes. She has to learn how to see more of the negative in people. And, you know, I mean, and so, you know, I, I laugh about it because in my profession, that's all I do is see the negative. So for me, it's, it, I don't know, maybe there's such a thing as toxic negativity too. I need to, I need to heal from that. But, um, John, I, John and I had to get through something the other day. It was really, it was a really busy day and we were running around and we had a few things to do. And I looked at him and I said, babe, just follow my lead. I'll be your my I'll be your toxic positivity today, yeah. sweetheart. I got you. I, I wish I wish there was like a a, um, a tonic for toxic negativity. <laughs> I that which it's not to say that I I I I find good moments every day. I have joy every day. It's not to say that there aren't moments that matter and that are are positive and valuable and that I really cherish. I think it's just in my field, I think one of the elements of my field is that I'm constantly bumping up against the possibility of nihilism. And I don't know how I'm just putting, I, I don't know how else to put it. I'm just trying to be honest about that, but that when human beings kill other human beings for no discernible reason, especially children, it, you know, it, it, you question or I question I question sometimes what that means. And um, sometimes what that means can be extremely difficult to digest. So, um, so there's that, but, but we're talking about Judy and, and this toxic positivity, I think that, or so that type of approach to seeing people is going to limit our ability to really, see those red flags or see negative elements in other people, I think, to some degree. Yeah. So we have a good balance. You're the, you're the toxic negativity in our relationship and I'll be your toxic positivity. Those were our Valentine's day cards. Babe. <laughs> yeah. I feel like maybe we should, we should write a card and send it to Hallmark and see if they'll, that about the the toxic pole, the polar <laughs> yin to my yang, and now we're gonna do your <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're my toxic positivity to my toxic. I don't know, whatever. Well, negativity. Just I think yeah. actually maybe we have maybe we have some new merch Valentine's Day cards. <laughs> <laughs> Please be my toxic positivity, <laughs> and I'll be your toxic negativity to balance you out. <laughs> Yeah, that do, actually, that doesn't sound, when you say it like that, it doesn't sound great. That sounds like it's a one-way street to divorce or something. But th thank you for hanging in there with me in spite of my pot toxic negativity. <laughs> no, it's good. It's We're a good pair. We're a good pair. We do our best. And sometimes there's just full-on toxic negativity in the house, and we still do our best. <laughs> right, and that's that's when we order pizza. <laughs> Because the pizza, and then the pizza is the toxic positivity, right? <laughs> because we the eat it all. The pizza is a sheer, it's a it's a sheer antidote to toxic negativity. Um, 
depending on where we get it from. So, but anyway, you had some other questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let me see what I've starred. Oh, and Lamisa is reminding us. I'll just share this right now. Yes, I will be in St. George. Reminder that a lot of us care about the Ruby, Frankie, and Jody Hildebrandt sentencing in two days on February 20th. It is Tuesday, February 20th. Yep. I will be in town for that sentencing, and I will also be on Law and Crime. So join our channel, Hidden to Crime, or go check us out at Law and Crime as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is a this is a loaded question too, but but let's let's narrow it down. Uh, Emily is asking, how did he get away with this? I guess that's similar to the question we've been asking, but how do time and time again do these predators get away with this for so long? I again, I th I think the seventies. If you're going to become a serial killer, the '70s were a much more opportune period to do it than today, because there's there's much more surveillance today. There's contact DNA. There's much more sophisticated DNA testing. Um, I you know the the and as we talked about, I think in that particular community, there seems to be there seems to have been some level of denial, right? That that. If Jim Mordecai was a suspect or should have been a suspect, nobody was willing to identify him. Everybody knew. I think one of our gems said earlier that he was like the biggest, his pathologies were like the biggest open secret in the community. And well, I, right I love there. That. Melissa, there you go. It's odd how Jim was this open secret. Yeah. That's cool. open secret. I love that. I love the juxtaposition of open and secret, by the way. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's, um, I, I, you know, I, I, open secret. Yeah. That's, that's what this was that he was, people in the community knew who this guy was, but nobody was willing to say anything. Um, Shannon, Shannon had an incident she talks about in the documentary where she was in the greenhouse and he essentially was trying to assault her or at least testing her, grooming her. And she went to one of the school counselors and reported him. And, and, and she said that he, the, the counselor laughed her out of his office. So nobody was willing to take him seriously as a suspect. And I mean, that's part of the issue too, is I think you have to have, people in the community that are willing to take somebody like him seriously and not cover it up or not push it aside, not repress it. And people are willing to, to report it openly without fear of repercussions. Even, even tonight with Kay, our guest Kay, many, many years later, I don't know what, so 40 plus years later, she's, She's still concerned about how people in that community will react to her. I know. Right. I think, right. That, that speaks volumes. So can you imagine how people must have felt back in the seventies? No. Yeah. Right. We live in a world now where it's like picks or it didn't happen. Right. We, we want ultimate proof. <laughs> think of the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, so I think sometimes today, even when you have ultimate proof, it's still denied. So, uh, yeah, that's I don't true know. True, too. I like that. That's true, too. Uh, seeing is typically not always believing. Believing <laughs> is seeing, as we, we right. say here at Hidden True Crime. Even with ultimate proof, you still sometimes uh, only see what you believe. Um, John? More specifically, and this might be a rinse and repeat question for you. I, I That's the term I use when I ask John a, a question I've asked again and again and again, but I think it's so important. What are red flags of somebody like Jim Mordecai, of somebody that people trust in the community, that they look up to this guy? I just, it blows my mind every time that there is somebody that is a perpetrator or a criminal 
and every time people are like, no, 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 this is a good person. This is a good person. You have somebody standing by him till the very end. No, they're a good person. You don't understand. I think about that too. Whenever I trust someone too, you know, what are red flags? What are some red flags of somebody like this, of, of the Chad Daybells, of the Jody Hildebrands, of the Jim Mordecai's, of the Tim Ballard's? Well, with, with, so yeah, right. So with, with, with more Jim Mordecai, you know, the first time he engages in inappropriate behavior with a student, that would be a red flag. The second time he does it, he should be at the very least, he should be questioned. He should be singled out as problematic, right? Like I, I don't, so the problem here is there were red flags because he was engaging in all kinds of inappropriate behaviors with students on multiple occasions, multiple students. And again, nobody was doing anything. There were no consequences for his behaviors. So the message he received is that it was perfectly fine. It was acceptable. So I, I think, you know, and it, but it, so obviously a major red flag and, and, and Kay pointed that out because there, there were rumors. Everybody in the school knew that or seemed to know it. And you I know, don't know. Not everyone. I think not everyone, we, but, we, we heard of victims being completely blindsided. So that's not true. I, and I think true. maybe that's what I'm referring to. People like that, that don't know those things. Well, With someone so, is the nice person, you know, how, what is the red flag? But I, I think she pointed out that he wasn't necessarily a nice person. I think the red flags would be pushing adolescents off of donkeys during games that, you know, that, that are grabbing students inappropriately or losing your composure with students or throwing things in a classroom, right? All, I mean, okay. you know, and, and that's not to say that some teachers get a pass for doing some of those behaviors at once in a blue moon. But I mean, being a high school teacher is hard. I'm sure there are yeah. quite a few of them that lose their temper. It's hard. right, day but, in, day but, out. it's hard. It, but doing it as frequently as Jim Mordecai seemed to do, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The red flags are any type of aggressive or violent or inappropriate behavior that's on display repeatedly, especially in a public format, a public forum where, where it's being seen. I mean, the, the, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, I don't know how the school could not take that seriously, but I mean, I, I guess it was the seventies. So. Yeah. The seventies. So, so if you have a nice teacher in the seventies, there's a red flag. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it's, he's not the pro the red flags are that he's not nice all the time. The red flags are that beneath that veneer and that facade, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of aggression. There's a lot of, and, and, you know, again, getting back to Kay, she sensed that she intuited that she saw it. She trusted that. And a need to be liked too. Right. I think that's another red flag. It just kind of made me think of it. This, this need for attention and to be liked a little bit like a teacher in that. I just think about every teacher now that, had this desperate need for approval from students. Um, yeah. And yeah, they probably had a temper. I guess I'm thinking of one teacher in particular. So that's why I was like, yeah, he had a temper. So I'm jumping to also <laughs> this incessant need yeah. for attention. But even then you can't, you can't make the assumption that, I don't know, it, it's hard because you, you can't go on, you can't really go beyond what you're seeing. Just because a teacher is consistently anger doesn't necessarily mean that that teacher is a serial killer, right? There have, there right, have to be, exactly. other, there have to be other components of it, but certainly it's, it's a teacher that's consistently angry and punishing others, punishing their students for it. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So it, and, or if they, if they, you know, if they are in charge of agriculture and they have animals and they, seem to take sadistic pleasure in harming animals. That's a red flag too. So, right. right I don't, you know, most teachers don't aren't in that position, but Jim Mordecai was. So I, I, 
I think there are a lot of red flags if if you're paying attention. That doesn't necessarily mean that they translate into harming other people, though. Sandy says, I taught my daughters that there is a huge difference between being nice and good. Our society seems to miss this, and that's unfortunate because the bad guys have to appear nice to find victims. True. Yeah. We're not always nice, too. Good people sometimes. Right. Right. Having always a moral nice compass. on a bad day either. Yeah. Being nice and having a moral compass are very, that's, that's a good point. They're, they're, those are very different elements or components of someone's personality. Yeah. Yeah. And someone else is saying arrested development seems common. Yeah, possibly. Anyway, um, I'm reading. Anyway, anything else, babe? I mean, you have a lot to talk to about uh, at the book club. When is the book club? You're going to talk further about this and you're going to allow yeah. many people to ask their questions and to discuss their thoughts and feelings about the truth about Jim. When is your book club? It's February 28th, 6 p.m. Pacific time. So that is that next week? I think it's next week, right? Um yeah, I right. I'm curious to get our um, our viewers' input and perceptions, and so I kind of throw mine out there. I guess my 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 views won't be as private now, but but I would like to know people's thoughts. Yes, it'll be a great discussion. So for anyone that wants to have this discussion on a Zoom meeting, it's usually about an hour and a half, two hours, uh, book club evening. Join us over at Patreon, <laughs> excuse me, dot com slash hidden true crime and join uh, the membership for the book club. And we'll see you there on the February 28th. And you can certainly bring your questions to the Zoom meeting. It's a wonderful meeting with our gems. We love it. I call them our book club babes because it's Dr. Babe's book club. <laughs> so. But we, we also have some wonderful men as well that attend. Yes. All right. Um, Ash, email us. We'll send you the link. We've grandfathered all of our, our uh, old uh, our book club people into the book club, our older members. So, Ash, send us an email at hiddentruecrimeinfo at gmail.com. Anything else, sweetheart? Just, I just want to, we haven't talked about it a lot tonight, but I want to reiterate the importance of the, what, what a, the process of this documentary is a family coming to terms with their past secrets mm -hmm. and discussing those, those secrets openly. And I think that's what, in the end, the, as Sierra says, she says, quote, this process changed our whole family. And so I, I, I think what we, again, yeah. we didn't, we didn't talk about it. But just, it's something we talk about a lot on our channel. It's just the importance of, of having the courage to, to delve into these types of family secrets and to have open discussions about them and not be intimidated by someone like Jim Mordecai. And, you know, there's something healing, I obviously about, bringing those types of secrets into the open and, and talking about those past traumas. And so I think an important part of this documentary is that even though it doesn't have any, it doesn't offer answers, which is a little frustrating. Um, and I saw in some of the early reviews that some of the reviewers were frustrated because they want, you know, most, most of us in true crime want some resolution by the end, especially in, in, in crime fiction. I think there's this expectation that there's going to be resolution, but that's not always how life works. You know, I think that oftentimes there's, we live with a lot of ambiguity. And so sometimes the process alone can be healing and can be valuable. And that's something we talk about a lot. And, and that's what this documentary I think really is about and is watching a family heal and deal openly with family secrets and really come together over, over a trauma a past trauma that's haunted them for many years and and now it doesn't. So 
are, are a dozen, let's just say a dozen as much. So, um, so I think it's important to reiterate that because you and I talk a lot about the importance of openness and open discussions and honest discussions and trying to talk openly about family secrets or any secrets that might be impacting our behavior or our relationships. Your mic's off. Your mic's still off. Hello, hello. Testing. Yep, you're you're good. Okay, I'm good. As you always say, we're as sane or as sick as the secrets we keep. Right. Exactly. And it's and never just, too late. Yeah, and 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 so I guess my final th so that by the way is probably one of the fundamental ideas from Freud and Freudianism is the idea of repression. Hmm. That if if you ask me to summarize Freud's ideas as succinctly as possible, I think I would say it's about repression and repre Freud's basic idea is that the more we repress information, secrets, traumas, our, you know, elements of our lives, um, the more likely it is that those, those repressed ideas or, um, secrets will come back and haunt us, that they'll show up as symptoms. They'll show up as mental health issues. They'll show up in, in so many ways. And so, um, and so in a, in a way, and that's true with families too, in a way, this is, this is kind of an argument for that to, um, try to, you know, resist repressing things that are painful or resist repressing things that, that can create a certain amount of suffering, right? And and to try to deal with them openly. Yes. Kay Louise says, thank you, Dr. John. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you, Kay Mer Thank you. Yeah, Kay. and thanks, thanks, Kay, for joining us. We're really grateful and appreciate you taking the time to, to give your input on Jim. I think you provided some insights that we just, we wouldn't have had otherwise. So thank you very much, Kay. Yes. And if anybody else has any insights into Jim Mordecai, you can email us at hidden true crime info at gmail.com or any other case that we are following closely. We have some exciting things coming up at hidden true crime. So stay tuned. We can't share everything, but we are working very hard behind the scenes and we'll hopefully be making some announcements soon. Uh, again, for those to, to remind you this week coming up, some big things coming up. We have a hearing for Chad Daybell. Uh, John Pryor has filed uh, another attempt to push back the trial and or remove the death penalty. We have, um, I've heard that there's there's movement in the Tim Ballard case or, or, or civil suit. There is Jody Hildebrand and Ruby Frankie uh, sentencing. That's a very big deal on Tuesday. We've been waiting for that. They both took a plea deal. I will be there as well as reporting for law and crime that day. So stay tuned this week. A lot, a lot is coming up. And then of course we'll have John's book club discussing the truth about Jim uh, at patreon.com slash hidden true crime. And thank you to all of those Patreon members who join over there and help support our work. It means a lot. Anything else? John. I think we're ready to sign off. All right. A sign off. Thank you, everyone. And have John's laugh. You laughing at me? I go, a sign off. That was that wasn't just a smile. That was a laughing. That was like, I'm trying not to laugh at my wife right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't the most dramatic ending. So it, you know, I I we've done better with our endings, but yeah. <laughs> It's okay. It's a good ending. My mic's on. So, you know, <laughs> that's helpful. It's, it's nice to do a show with your mic on. Yes. So that's a win. All okay. right, everyone. Have All a right. great night. Okay. Good night. Good night.